Hello friends, would you like to hear an amazing fact? Experts believe that many of the ancient temples in the world, such as the Great Pyramids of Giza, Stonehenge in England, Chichen Itza in Mexico, also serve, they also served as astronomical clocks or calendars where they could use them to mark the winter or summer solstice and maybe even predict an eclipse of the moon or the sun. You know, the Bible tells us that there's an ancient temple that's also connected with a great date in history. Stay with us. We're going to talk about it on this presentation of Revelation Now. We'd like to welcome you back to Revelation Now, a series dealing with some of the most important prophecies in the Bible. We'd like to welcome all of those joining us across the country and literally around the world. And we want to remind you, if you've missed any of these previous programs, they're all available on the Revelation Now website in the archive section. We want to encourage you to go back and take a look at those that you've missed. Maybe you want to watch one again and write down some Bible verses. You're welcome to do that. We also have live Spanish translation of each of these presentations, and that's available at the Amazing Facts uh, Revelation Now Latino website, as well as the AF Latino Facebook and YouTube channels. Also, we are translating for the deaf, and you can get information about that at the Revelation Now website. And then we would like to uh, welcome those who are joining us in Cambodia this evening in particular. We've had folks contact us from more than 100 countries around the world, people letting us know, hey, we're watching over here. And so we would like to greet those in Cambodia who are watching this program. We'd also like to thank those who have sent in your testimonies. We always enjoy reading testimonies. Uh, Jordan from Tennessee says, Thank you for the teaching of the Word of God. It has helped me, and I can't wait for Jesus to return. We like to hear those testimonies. We have uh, Tania from Australia. She says, I have been blessed by these seminars. Thank you. And then Meredi from Qatar. Thanks to these amazing messages, I've been so blessed, especially the one on the millennium. And then I like this testimony from Donna in West Virginia. She says, I want to thank you for this series. You have really changed my life. Uh, please pray for me, for I am new to these things. But I feel the Spirit working on my heart, and I look forward to every broadcast. So welcome, Donna. And then finally, uh, Cheryl Lane from Hawaii sends her greetings. She says, we have been life-changingly transformed by these programs a big thank you. And we want to greet uh, Sherilyn and her family, and you can see them there on the screen. If you'd like to upload a picture of your group where you might be watching the program, you can do so by just going to the Revelation Now website. Tonight's topic is entitled Cleansing the Sanctuary. And as always, we have a study guide that goes along with tonight's presentation. It has the same name as the presentation today, Cleansing the Sanctuary. If you'd like to download a copy of our study guide, you can do so at the Revelation Now website. We also have a free gift, one of our Amazing Facts study guides. This is additional information, and we'll be happy to send this out to anyone who asks. All you have to do is text the word PLANS to the number 40544, and you'll receive a digital download of our study guide entitled God Drew the Plans. Now, of course, if you're outside of North America, and you aren't able to text, just go to the Revelation Now website and you'll be able to download that study guide, God Drew the Plans. Well, at this time, I'd like to invite Pastor Doug to come forward. Um, Pastor Doug, we have a very important presentation this evening. Yes. I know uh, we were just talking before we went live on the air. Uh, there's a lot of information that we want to try and cover. A very important time prophecy Amen. that we find in the Bible too. So. We're going to get right to that. Let's start with a word of mm -hmm. prayer. Dear Father, we thank you once again that we're able to take time to open up your word and study. And we do ask for your spirit to be with us and be with those who are listening across this country and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And once again, friends, don't go away after this presentation. We're going to be getting back together again and answering your Bible question. So I would encourage you, if you've got any questions on the study that you're going to hear tonight, and I expect there will be some, uh, you can just send them in via Facebook, and we'll be looking at a number of those after the presentation. Uh, as Pastor Ross mentioned, tonight's study is called Cleansing the Sanctuary. We're going to be talking about the temple in the Bible, the temple that's in the world today, 
talk a little bit about will the Jewish temple ever be rebuilt and does God have a temple in heaven? But uh, before we go to the study, I thought it'd be good once again, just go out on the street and interact a little bit with some American citizens and find out what their feedback is regarding some of these issues. Okay, I do believe that the Hebrew temple will be built in Israel. I also believe that God will be calling all of the Israelites home, Jewish people home, before the end of time. The temple was a very specific, it had to be built in a very specific way. And in some of the early books of the Old Testament, it talked about, uh, you know, the exact dimensions of everything and that sort of thing. And wasn't there a veil? And uh, you couldn't go behind the veil or something like that. And then, uh, yeah, I guess the, the purpose of the temple, I guess, again, I'm not a scholar on this, but was to house the scriptures. The Old Testament sanctuary in the Bible, I think, was used to protect the Ten Commandments. Well, they've got some interesting concepts there, but uh, some of them are very close to the truth regarding what was the purpose of the Jewish temple. Now, when we talk about the temple, you might be thinking, what in the world does this subject have to do with the book of Revelation? You can read in Revelation, it tells us, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one stood like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about with his chest with a golden band. The book of Revelation is set in the context of a temple, in particular, the temple that you find in the Bible. It's so important to understand this subject because as you go through the scriptures, you're going to find that the Jewish temple appears over and over again in prophecy. I've got just a small list here that I can share with you. If you look, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 6, he has this vision. He sees God on his throne in the temple of heaven with the two angels on the right and the left called cherubim. And they're crying, holy, holy, holy. And uh, then you go to Ezekiel chapter 40, chapter 41. Temple is mentioned over and over again. Not only there, you find it in Revelation. You can find reference to the candlesticks that were in the temple the altar of sacrifice in the temple, that's Revelation 6, verse 9. The altar of incense, that's Revelation 8, verse 3. It's mentioned four times there. The Ark of the Covenant, that was the container for the Ten Commandments, is in Revelation 11, verse 19. It's in Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Jonah, Micah, Habakkuk, Haggai, Zechariah, and the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi. And Jesus talks about it during his ministry. This is probably one of the most neglected subjects that uh, Christians are, are hearing about that is all the way through the Bible. And in the same way that some of those ancient temples were designed for, mar they were just to keep the sun off of them or to, um, you know, just house a place of worship, there was something in their design that had a lot of sophistication and meaning well, nothing could be more true of the Hebrew temple. And we're going to find out a little more about that as we delve into our study today. Now, you remember when the Lord first brought the people out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea, he did not lead them right up to the promised land. He took them down to Mount Sinai, took them south and away from the promised land to Mount Horeb. And there, of course, Moses gets the Ten Commandments. But he was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And all that time on the mountain was not just so God could write the Ten Commandments. While he was up there on the mountain, God gave Moses very specific instructions on how to build a sanctuary. This was going to be a very unique building. And the Bible tells us, thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. The way that God saves people is in this ancient Hebrew structure. It also tells us about Christ. You remember when uh, Jesus was there at the Jewish temple and the religious leaders were debating with him and he said destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up and they said wow it's taken 46 years for us to build this temple how are you going to raise it up in three days but he wasn't speaking of the physical temple he was talking about his body the church is called the temple of God this ancient structure teaches us about the church te teaches us about our physical bodies teaches us about the plan of salvation and it teaches us about prophecy, as we'll find out more tonight. 
Now, just to give you an introduction, I got a picture on the screen here. This is sort of an aerial view of the first temple. Now, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, there's really three temples. You've got the temple that Moses built. It was a portable tabernacle like the one you see here that they carried with them as they wandered through the wilderness. Then when they settled in the promised land, David amassed an enormous amount of gold and silver and he helped his son build this beautiful temple, sometimes called Solomon's Temple, and uh, it lasted about 400 years. That was destroyed, as we mentioned in an earlier study, by King Nebuchadnezzar. And then after they came back from the Babylonian captivity under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, they then built a third temple. That was later refurbished by uh, Herod the Great. He was a, um, a very passionate builder, a Hasmonean king, but he's also a wicked man. He's the one that killed the babies in Bethlehem. But he loved building, and he refurbished the temple. So it was one of the wonders of the world during the Roman era, the Jewish temple, until it was destroyed in 70 A.D. And many are wondering, is that temple going to be rebuilt again? We're getting ahead of ourselves. I'll get to that. So just looking at this picture of the first tabernacle going through the wilderness. Okay, take a breath. Friends, you got to help me tonight. I need you to listen fast because I'm going to talk fast. So after this program is over, hopefully you've got software. You can slow down the sermon and listen to it again because I've got to cover a lot of information and I want it to be clear. The temple had one entrance. There's one way for salvation. Jesus said, I am the door. Anyone else that comes over the wall is a thief and a robber. Jesus is the door. There was one door. First thing you saw when you came in was an altar for sacrificing lambs. Jesus is the lamb. The one who would offer the sacrifice was the high priest. Jesus is the high priest. And then you went to the altar there. That's a symbol of the cross. The next thing is you would come to the altar of water, the laver of water. That represents Jesus, who is also our living water. And after you accept Christ, and uh, then we go to, you accept the blood of the lamb, and then you go to the water. Children of Israel, they sacrificed the Passover lamb, then they went through the Red Sea. You can read in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul said the plan of salvation is like what the children of Israel did. They were baptized in the fire, and the water. Jesus said, unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. You had to go by the fire and the water before you went towards the presence of God. We must be born uh, of the water and the fire. The water represents our choice of baptism. The fire is God's choice, his spirit. And then we move into the next area together. Once you got, and here again is a, just a, an artist's rendering of the altar and the labor, and then once you entered the, the uh, main temple, the first apartment was called the holy place. In there, you had a seven-lamp candlestick. You know, in Revelation chapter 1, Jesus first appears in this room, in the sanctuary, among the seven candlesticks. Not in an earthly temple, but in a heavenly temple. And Jesus is the light of the world. But not only is Jesus the light of the world, he said to the church, you are to reflect my light. You are the light of the world. Do not put your light under a bush. Uh, by the way, the walls of the temple were um, golden, and so they would reflect the light. Then on the opposite side was a table called the table of showbread, and there were 12 loaves of bread. Jesus is the bread of life, and that represents the word of God. And then directly in front of the veil, there's only three articles of furniture in this room, but they're all full of meaning, was the altar of incense. They would come in and they had hot coals there. They took the coals off the altar out in the courtyard. They brought them in. They put them there. They would put some beautiful incense, some frankincense or myrrh on there. That was representing then the prayers of God's people that would waft over this veil. This altar of incense was in front of a veil that separated the last compartment that represented the presence of God and that was where the Ark of the Covenant was. But back to the three articles of furniture in this room. They represent, and they all represent Jesus. Jesus is our high priest that intercedes with our prayers. And uh, you've got three articles of furniture. Of course, there's three persons in the Godhead. There are three disciplines in the Christian life. You have Bible, prayer, witnessing, letting your light shine. The lamp, let your light shine. The altar of incense, prayer. The table of shoe bread, the Bible, 
Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word. Those are the three secret weapons to success in the Christian life. You show me a backslidden Christian, I will show you somebody who is neglecting one of those three things. They're either not spending time in the word, they're not spending time on their knees, and they're not letting others know about their faith. If you don't do those things, you cannot flourish as a Christian. Then you go into the inner sanctum, the holy of holies. It was called one thing in there. This was the most sacred place in the Jewish world. And it was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And as some of our on the street interviews said, wasn't it something to contain the scriptures? Well, yes, it was the scriptures written by the finger of God. On the outside of the ark, and you can see in this picture there's a scroll leaning against the outside, that was the, the ordinances and the ceremonial laws. They were put in a pocket on the outside of the ark. On the inside of the ark, you have the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God. The Word of God, the Law of God, written on stone. Everybody wishes they could find the golden box, but what was really important was the rocks in the box, and if you want to know what is in the rocks in the box, you have it in your Bible in Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. That's the Ten Commandments, the Holy Word of God. And so the top of the ark where the two angels are, the Shekinah glory would appear to Moses and Aaron on the Day of Atonement. Moses, whenever he went in, God would communicate. It represented the presence of God. And so this is a, a miniature picture of a very real temple that God has in heaven. And we learn about the plan of salvation from this temple. Now, we're going to go, uh, before we get into our questions, we always like to start with uh, a study and a story, I should say, from the Bible. Uh, many of you remember when uh, Jesus, he did it twice, once at the beginning and once at the end of his ministry. He was in Jerusalem, and he went into the temple, and he was very uh, offended by what he saw because this place that was to be a house of prayer they were now selling sacrifices and the priests and salesmen were arguing with the worshipers over the price and they had to exchange their money for the temple coin and they did this at much inflated prices and they were arguing and debating and you could hear the lowing of the oxen and the cooing of the doves and the bleeding of the sheep and it was a bazaar. It was like a cacophony of confusion. And Jesus went in there and he heard the sights and the smells and the sound and, and he walked over and he took some cords that were probably used to like tie off the sheep. And he said, take these things hence. He made a whip out of the cords. Take these things hence. My father's house is to be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he chased them all out of the temple. Now it's interesting, he did this twice during his ministry. And uh, when he said it, he said, my father's house, my father's house, but at the end of his ministry, the last time he left the temple, he said, behold, your house is left to you desolate. His wording changed. Somewhere along the way, he said, it went from my father's house to your house. Because when they as a nation rejected Jesus, the purpose of that temple was going to meet its completion at that point. So we're going to get into our lesson now, and I think this is going to make more sense as we unpack it along the way. First question. We begin by studying the longest time prophecy that tells us about when the sanctuary is cleansed. We just saw Jesus cleansing the sanctuary in the New Testament. There's a prophecy in the Old Testament. Go to Daniel chapter 8. Now I'm going to read a little bit. Daniel chapter 8. And in this prophecy, here the prophet talks about a great judgment day and the sanctuary being cleansed. So I'll begin with oh, verse 3 here or the end of verse 2, I guess. And I saw in the vision, and I was by the river Uli. And then I lifted my eyes, and I saw, and there standing by the river was a ram. Okay, that's a male sheep who had two horns. And the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And it came up last. And I saw the ram pushing westward, northward, and southward, so that no animal could withstand him. Nor was there any that could deliver from his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. And as I was considering, suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole ground without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable high horn between his eyes. And when he came to the ram that had the two horns, 
which I had seen standing by the river, he ran at him with furious power. And I saw him confronting the ram. And he was moved with rage against him and attacked the ram and broke his two horns. And there was no power in the ram to withstand him. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled him. And there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore the male goat grew very great. But when he became strong, the large horn was broken. And in its place, four notable horns came up. That's interesting. You've got a goat with four horns. Towards the four winds. And out of one of those four horns, it sprouted off a little branch, a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south and the east and towards the glorious land. And it grew up to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host, the stars, to the ground. And it trampled them. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. And by him the daily sacrifices were taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Because of transgression an army was given over to him to oppose the daily sacrifices. This is the plan of salvation. And he cast the truth down to the ground. All right. So we talk about this this goat and ram. They represent kingdoms. And it tells us the ram, he comes up and then the goat destroys him. The main horn of the goat broken off, four horns come up, a sprout comes off one of those horns that grows into a great kingdom and it begins the war against God and it casts the truth down to the ground. So the issue in this study is what's going on when he casts the truth down to the ground? And it says, Then I heard one holy one, an angel, speaking and another holy one said to that certain one that was speaking, How long? Now the angels are asking a question about a time prophecy regarding nations. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifices and transgression of desolation? Now, Jesus talks about the abomination of desolation, the transgression of desolation, the giving of both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot. Now, here's the punchline of what we're studying right now. He said unto me, For 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Okay, I did a lot of reading, but now I wanted you to get the backdrop if you didn't get it all, don't worry. We're going to back up and we're going to explain it as we proceed. Daniel has an amazing vision in which he sees a ram with two horns. Who does this ram represent? Well, the angel comes back and he explains. The ram which you ha saw having the two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. You got two horns, but one ends up getting higher. That's because it started out as the Medo-Persian kingdom. They were going to be a dual confederacy. But the Medians sort of got absorbed by the Persians and history really records it mostly now as the Persian Empire. So this is the Persian Empire that was the Medo-Persian Empire that was to follow the Babylonian Empire. In this vision in Daniel chapter 8, he doesn't talk about Babylon anymore. Babylon fell in chapter 6. So now he's talking about the next kingdom and the one after that and the one after that and we're going to catch up with those. Next, Daniel saw a goat with a great horn between his eyes. What does this mean? Well, let me just pause here for a moment. We're talking about these beasts. And these beasts represent different kingdoms, different powers. If I were to ask our studio audience here, um, if I say, an eagle, what country do you think of? Well, of course, you're in the United States. If you think of a lion, Great Britain, right? Think of a bear, the Ruskies in Russia. If you think of a dragon, China. China. So even today, we've got animals, and even states have their different animals. And so today, we think about animals associated with countries. They sort of got their animal logo. Well, in Bible prophecy, these different beasts represented different powers and kingdoms. And the horns, keep in mind, the Jewish people, they were a nation of shepherds. And so they were very well acquainted with sheep and goats. Jesus tells parables about the sheep and the goat being separated, Matthew 25. And so Daniel's given this vision in a way that his people could understand these different powers. It's given in apocalyptic symbols to protect it because he talks about the destruction of the Persian Empire and then later the destruction of the Greek Empire. Then he transitions into Rome, but I'm getting ahead again. Next, Daniel saw a goat with a great horn between his eyes. What does this mean? Well, it tells us that this goat that uh, demolishes the kingdom of Medo-Persia. History makes it pretty clear. 
The rough goat is the king of Grecia. Do we have to guess or does the Bible tell us what these things mean? The rough goat is the king of Greece and the horn between his eyes is the first king. Who is that Macedonian Greek king that uh, conquered with such speed? He, he's known through much of the world as Alexander the Great. And a very young king. He started like 18 years of age. And uh, in just about 11 years, he marched his army 11,000 miles. And he conquered the Persia and, and Egypt and many of the big kingdoms back then. And he did it quickly. And it says he grew very great. He, uh, you know, Alexander, when he traveled, he not only took a big army, he took almost as big an army of scientists and linguists and philosophers because he was spreading the Greek culture, which they believed was superior. And you can even see they can still find today some of the ancient Greek coins that have Alexander's image. He was that first large horn that was used to kill the ram. Alexander came against the Persians, and even though he was greatly outnumbered, he was such a brilliant general and so courageous that they had no power to stand against them. He just plowed ahead and his army followed after. But uh, it says that one being broken, Alexander could conquer the world, but he could not conquer himself. And they're not sure whether it was poisoning or malaria or um, uh, alcohol that, that did it. But uh, after a feast one night, he got a fever and died not long after. And I think I mentioned to you earlier that when his generals asked him, who will rule in your place? He said, the strongest, because he didn't really have a son old enough to rule. Now that being broken, when he died, it says, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms will stand up out of this nation. History is very clear about this, that Alexander's empire, was just it spread almost from India to Macedonia, down into Egypt. And, uh, but when he died, he had sort of divided his empire among his main four generals, Cassiander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. And uh, that was the divisions. It just as the prophecy said, in place of that one horn, four horns came up. It says, then a little horn sprouts up from out of one of the four horns. So from one division, I'm going to back up a slide here. You see one division of the kingdom, Cassiander, uh, he ended up taking all over some of the territory over by Rome. And from that sprout, another kingdom begins to come up. Well, when you read in the Bible, who was ruling after the Greeks? It says, Claudius Caesar had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome. Rome is the power that was ruling. They're the ones who, uh, of course, they had to get approval to execute Jesus from the Romans. So you've got this uh, great goat of the Greek kingdom, middle horn breaks off, main horn breaks up, four horns come up. Those are the four divisions, but out of one of them, the Roman Empire begins to emerge and it ends up growing bigger than the other three. And it overpowers all the others. And that's exactly what happened in history. Even today in architecture, we call it Greco-Roman because the Romans kind of grew up out of the Greeks. They adopted and absorbed a number of their gods and they adopted some of their culture and their, their, even their government. And it says, in this horn, this little horn, were eyes like the eyes of a man. Now, this is in Daniel 7, but it's talking about the same little horn. His eyes were like the eyes of a man, his mouth speaking great or pompous, blasphemous things. And he will be diverse from the first. And it's from this horn the Antichrist power comes. Now, I want to pause here. When we're talking about the beasts here in Daniel, we haven't read chapter 7 yet, but chapter 7's got a lion, a bear, a leopard, a strange beast, and we just read about a ram, a goat. And then you get to Revelation, and it talks about the beastie beast that is a conglomeration of these beasts, and it tells us that he's the one who enforces the mark of the beast we're not talking about some monster coming out of the ground. What we're talking about is it's going to be a, a power that is going to have an influence over the world. It now grows out of Rome and spreads. We're going to get to that. Matter of fact, this week, uh, Saturday morning, we have a program. Friday night, we have a program. And we also have a program Saturday night talking about the beast and the mark of the beast. So please tune in for those programs. 
So Daniel was told that this little horn would defile the sanctuary. How long till it would be cleansed? So we read this. He said, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Cleansed from what? Well, it said the beast's power would cast the truth to the ground and it would interfere with the daily sacrifice, meaning the sacrifice of the lambs represented the uh, work and ministry of Jesus, the gospel of salvation, and it would try to corrupt that and defile it with lies and cast the truth to the ground. So it's a religious political power. How did Daniel respond when he saw the little horn power persecuting God's people and obscure the truth? Now Daniel's getting older at this point. He's in his 80s, and he's so disappointed to see the persecution God's people are going through. He said, and I, Daniel, fainted, and I was sick certain days, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. And that's Daniel 8, 27. So the angel tries to help him understand these things, but... Daniel is, he's overwhelmed by it all. So the, dan the, the angel realizes Daniel's getting up there. He needs some time to rest and recover and ponder these things. And the angel then comes back in the next chapter and picks up where he left off to not only explain the starting point for this 2,300 days, but he also adds the most important prophecy that Daniel was praying about. When would the Messiah come? This was the yearning in the heart of every Jewish believer. So, you go to Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel, you read all of Daniel chapter 9, and we're going to turn there real quick. Daniel is praying, and in his prayer, he's wondering how long God is going to deal with his people, because they've got this roller coaster relationship. One of the main purposes for the Jewish nation was to demonstrate how God saves. The way that he saved them from Egypt, in spite of them being stubborn, tells us how God can save us in spite of our hard-heartedness sometimes. And he converts us and gives us those soft hearts in the new covenant experience. He's leading them through the plagues. The devil doesn't want to let go of them. Jesus saves us from the devil's resistance. Red Sea, baptized in the water. Pillar of fire, baptized in the fire. They get hungry, bread from heaven. Man lives by the word of God. They get thirsty, living water from a rock. Paul says, Jesus is the rock. The whole experience of the children of Israel is really telling us about the plan of salvation. And when they build that tabernacle out in the wilderness, it illustrates how we're saved, and the defiling of that tabernacle is representing a defiling of the gospel. And I think everyone knows there's a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of corruption that is constantly trying to find its way into Christianity. It's the most divided religion in the world. And that's because the devil is always attacking it. So Daniel begins his prayer, Daniel chapter 9, verse 23. And the angel comes to him. And the angel says, at the beginning of your supplication, the command went out, and I've come to tell you. That's good to know that uh, speed of light, 186,000 miles a second. Speed of sound, depending on air pressure and altitude, about 700 miles an hour. Angels travel a speed where the highway patrol will never catch you because he leaves heaven at the beginning of Daniel's prayer out in the cosmos somewhere and he streaks through space the speed of thought and gets to earth by the time Daniel's done praying. And he says, why has he come? In the next chapter, the angel explains the prophecy in greater detail. How long was the time period not previously mentioned in the vision? So now the angel says, look, I want to give you one more thing. You can handle before you fainted. I'm going to finish out my message and my mission. If you look in Daniel chapter 9, and it tells us, the angel says, I'll start with verse 22. And he informed me, by the way, this is Gabriel, who later we know because he comes to Mary hundreds of years later, and he hasn't aged a bit. It's nice to know we'll have glorified bodies like that someday. And so Gabriel, who I had seen at the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, he reached me about the time of the evening offering. And if you go to Daniel 9, verse 23, he says, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out from God. And I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Seventy weeks are determined. That word determined means cut off. Seventy weeks are determined for your people. Who are his people? 
Jewish nation, right? To finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision, to finish off this vision, and to anoint the most holy. Who is the most holy? It's got to be Jesus, right? Then he gives a time. He says, know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, okay, here it is. You can underscore this. This is verse 25. It's the starting point for the visions for both the 2,300 day vision and for the 490 year vision. So he said, 70 weeks are determined upon your people. A uh, week has got how many days? Seven? 70 weeks is how many days? Seven times seven, timetable? 49? All right, so you got seven times seven. You got 49 or 490 days, 70 weeks. Now, a day in prophecy is a year. So he says there's 70 weeks in this vision to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the command, here's the starting point, to restore and build Jerusalem. After they went home from the Babylonian captivity, king of Persia gave a command that they could restore and build Jerusalem. From that date unto the Messiah, the prince, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that's telling us seven and 62 is 69. The street will be built again and the wall in troublous times. That's what happened in the book of Nehemiah. They rebuilt the wall in troublous times. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. Messiah was cut off for us. And the people of the prince who shall come, as the persecuting power, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It was foretold that the city and the sanctuary would be destroyed. This is so clear because when this prophecy came, the old temple had been destroyed and wasn't even rebuilt. So Daniel's saying it's going to be rebuilt and destroyed again. And the end shall be with a flood. And the end of the war, desolations are determined. Abomination of desolation. And he, going back to the subject of the Messiah, he'll confirm the covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week, he'll bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall one be who makes desolate even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured on the desolate. That finishes out chapter 9. All right, back to our questions, and we'll expound as we go here. What was the starting point given for the 2,300 days and 70-week time prophecies? Both prophecies, one starting point. One's given in chapter 8. One the prophecy is given in chapter 9, but only starting point is in chapter 9. It tells us, Therefore, understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Now that means, it says, to anoint the most holy, the Messiah, the Prince. When was Jesus anointed? At his baptism. But we'll get to that in just a second. The decree of Artaxerxes, the starting point, was given in 457 B.C. And, you know, the Lord is good. He actually gives us the decree. It's in the Bible in Ezra chapter 7, verse 7. The very decree is reproduced, so we know what the starting point is. And it's a very clearly established date in history. We've got a lot of records in cuneiform and some of the Mesopotamian history that tell us when this decree went forth, also the Hebrew history. Now, in prophecy, when it talks about a day, it represents a year. Uh, you can see here in Ezekiel 4, 6, I have appointed thee each day for a year. If you look in Numbers 14, 34, each day for a year. Some of you remember when um, in Luke chapter 13, when the religious leaders uh, came and they warned Jesus, King Herod has killed John the Baptist. Jesus responded, he said, go tell that fox, I teach, do cures, perform miracles, cast out devils today tomorrow, and the third day I'll be perfected. Well, this was like six months into Jesus' ministry. He doesn't preach three more days. He preaches three more years. So even Jesus used the day for the year principle. So using that, if each prophetic day really equals a year, and you start at 457, let's see what happens here. The angel said, question eight, if you're to count 69 weeks from 457 B.C., you would come to the Messiah, the Prince. Did this happen? Now all this was fulfilled 
All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin will conceive and be with child and bring forth a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus came right on time, and it said that it would anoint the most holy. So keep in mind, you got 490 years in this 70-week prophecy, but it breaks it up. So at first, we're going to look at 483 years of it. And um, that reaches unto 27 AD if you start at 457 BC. When Jesus began preaching, you know what he said? The time is fulfilled. What's he talking about? He's pointing back to this prophecy that talks about his being anointed with the Holy Spirit. So if you look at 483, uh, 483 years from 457 BC, that reaches to 27 AD. Now, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 3, this is one of the most firmly established dates in history because there, Dr. Luke is very kind. He tells us, uh, you got uh, Tiberius Caesar, you got Pontius Pilate, you got Herod Philip, and Herod Agrippa. We know that there's only one time in history when all these kings overlap. And so here it is in 27 AD, Jesus comes to John the Baptist at the Jordan. He's baptized and the Holy Spirit comes down on him and he begins his ministry to anoint the most holy. Do you know Jesus never did a miracle up until he was baptized? It happened right on time. And you know the Jews should have been able to pinpoint pretty close what his birth would be because they knew that he couldn't begin serving as a priest until he was 30. You just count back 30 years from A.D. 27, Jesus was born about 4 B.C. So they could have been even used to calculate that. All right, let's keep going. It says, in the middle of that last week, he will confirm the covenant. So if you go three and a half years after 27 A.D., what happens? What was to take place next in the prophecy? After three score and two weeks. So you've got first the seven weeks. That's when they're building the wall and the street in troublous times. That's at 49 years during Ezra and Nehemiah. They're trying to rebuild the city and the temple. <clears throat> and it said, after that period of time, Messiah will be cut off, but not for himself. So you got a lot of cutting off happening here. It tells us that um, 70 weeks are cut off from my people. And here the Messiah is cut off in the middle of this last seven years. Jesus teaches for three and a half years and then he dies on the cross. It says he will make the sacrifice cease. He will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, with all due respect, I've got some friends out there and they think, oh, the one confirming the covenant, that's the Antichrist. Really? What covenant does the Bible say the Antichrist makes with anybody? There's no record. The subject of this prophecy is the Messiah coming. It's not talking about the Antichrist confirming a covenant. Jesus came to confirm the covenant that he made with his people, that he would be the one, the Messiah, to save them from their sins. It says in the midst of the week, Jesus teaches exactly three and a half years. That's half of seven. He dies on the cross, and what happens? He makes the sacrifice cease. The veil in the temple rips from top to bottom. Not only was the veil ripped, showing that we no longer use that temple, but the high priest tore his garments, which they were never supposed to do, meaning that we now have a new priesthood. We are a ro royal priesthood, a holy nation. Because the veil, 2 Corinthians 3.14, the veil is taken away in Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, do we need to sacrifice lambs anymore? No. So the, he caused the sacrifice to cease. And it's interesting that uh, when the temple was destroyed, the Jews have not had a sacrificial system from that time to the present day. That was because of Jesus, not the Romans. So it says that uh, exactly it, three and a half years later, he dies on the cross in 31 AD. But we've got three and a half more years before something significant and biblical happens. It says he confirms the covenant in person. Well, how does he confirm the covenant again now that he's gone to heaven? To whom did Jesus tell his disciples to first preach? It says, go not in the way of the gent. Wait a second. I thought Jesus wanted them to go everywhere. Not at first. When he was on earth, he even told this, um, this Phoenician woman, he said, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
He told the woman at the well, salvation is of the Jews. She wanted to argue with him. Do we sacrifice in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim? He said, salvation is of the Jews. I am sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Jesus' ministry was to confirm the covenant with the children of Abraham for one week. Three and a half years in person. And then Jesus said to the apostles, as the Father sent me, so send I you. Three and a half years, he specifically had them preaching to the Jews. Do not go in the way of the Gentiles. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The first audience for the apostles was Jews. On the day of Pentecost, there were devout Jews gathered. And the Holy Spirit was poured out and 2,000 Jews were baptized. A few days later, 5,000 Jews. I said 2,000. Was it 2,000? 3,000, yeah. And then 5,000, a few days later, were baptized. Their first ministry for the first three and a half years after Christ was only to the Jewish nations. Notice now, how does Jesus continue to confirm the covenant? Read in Hebrews 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord? Began to be confirmed by the Lord but was later confirmed. What's that word? Confirmed to us by those who heard him. He confirms the covenant with the Jewish nation three and a half years in person. Then he says, now I'm sending you. Don't go to the lost Gentiles yet. Go first to the lost sheep of house of Israel. So what happens then after they do that for three and a half years? A lot believe. There's also a lot of persecution. What warning did Jesus give his chosen people? The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits. If they did not embrace the truth, a terrible judgment was going to come. Now, I, I probably, in the interest of full disclosure, should let everyone know that I am Jewish. Uh, my mother was Jewish, and I say that that makes you Jewish, and I, I kind of embrace that. And so I'm saying these things with, you know, 100% uh, buy-in to what I'm telling you. He says, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth. What does he want? Fruits. He went to a fig tree with no fruits. What did he do? He cursed it and it withered. And what's going to happen if we don't bring forth fruit? Read in John 15. If we don't abide in the vine, cut off, burn. We've got to bring forth fruit, the fruits of the Spirit. If it bears fruit, remember the parable in Luke 13, if it bears fruit, this man's got a fig tree in his vineyard. He says, don't cut it down. He digs around it. He cultivates it. He does everything he can. He says, if it bears fruit, well, if not, you shall do what? Cut it down. So who is the other nation spoken of by Jesus which would become his chosen people? Now, you've got to listen very carefully. If you, now, this is the scripture. Did I write this or did Paul write this? Galatians. This is the Bible, friends. Galatians 3.29, if you be Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Again, Romans, this is Paul, 2, 28 and 29, written by a Jew. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly. Now, does this mean that the Jewish nation has been forsaken as a people? Not as a people, no. Matter of fact, Paul says that Gentiles are grafted into the stock of Israel and we partake of the fruit and the fatness of all the promises that God gave Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We, New Testament Christians, are saved by the promises God made to the house of Israel. What is the old covenant? I will make, a, what's the new covenant rather? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. So every Gentile really has to embrace the covenant God made with the Jews. So, now what happened three and a half years after Christ died? It's in your Bible. Stephen, one of those deacons who was filled with the Holy Spirit, he was preaching and converting many, and some of the religious leaders became very threatened, and they brought him into the same court where Jesus was tried. He tries to defend himself, and they plug their ears. What does it mean if judges plug their ears? That's not good. They plug their ears, they grind their teeth, they take him out of the city, and they stone him three and a half years after Jesus was taken out of Jerusalem through a, a kangaroo court and falsely condemned. The Bible says they took off Christ's clothes and they gambled. Before Stephen is executed, they take their clothes and they lay them at the feet of Saul. 
Jesus dies on the cross. He says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Three and a half years later, Stephen says, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. It's an echo of everything that Jesus did. They now took it out on his apostles. Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. And so a great persecution arose. And guess who gets converted right after this experience? Saul. He gets converted. He becomes Paul. One of the greatest, writes about half the New Testament, one of the greatest converts, a Jew who accepts Jesus. And where does the gospel go? It goes to the Gentiles. And then you go to chapter 10. Peter then, he takes the gospel to the home of Cornelius. God tells Peter, do not call unclean what I have cleansed. Speaking of the Jewish nation. Got to hasten on here. Question 13. Uh, you thought I was kidding when I said I was going to talk fast. I was serious. According to the angel who spoke with Daniel, what would happen at the end of the 2,300 years? Now we're going to Daniel chapter 8, that longest of the time prophecies in the Bible. He said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. All right, let me talk to you for just a minute about what the sanctuary is. Now, they had three temples in the Old Testament. They had the tabernacle. They had the temple of Solomon, the temple of Ezra and Nehemiah. Also was the same temple that was there when Jesus was there that was later destroyed by the Romans. Many are wondering, when it talks about the temple now, will the Jewish temple be rebuilt? You've got to turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. He's talking about the days of the end. And you go to verse 1. Now, brethren... Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, friends, that's not far off, and our gathering to him, being caught up to meet him, we ask that you not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or word or letter from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. That day will not come unless there come a falling away first. Falling away where? Not in the world. It's already fallen. Falling away in the church. The truth would be cast to the ground in a big way, even among professed believers. And it tells us, then it says, that man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, this is the beast power, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Okay. People read that and they say, well, the, the Jewish temple's got to be built. If the Antichrist is going to sit, and I agree, this is the Antichrist, if he's going to sit in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, we've got to rebuild the temple. Uh, unless you understand what the temple is. Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, I will make one without hands. Paul said, what you don't, don't you know? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He tells us in Ephesians that you are spiritual stones and Peter says we are being built up a spiritual house under the Lord and so is there still a temple on earth yes it's the church and the antichrist power is going to claim to sit with authority over the church claiming prerogatives that belong to God you don't want to miss Saturday morning and Saturday night's presentations we're going to be talking about who that beast power is but uh, everybody in the Christian world is waiting for them to rebuild the temple I've been to Israel several times and, you know, I can't imagine a scenario where Islam is going to allow the Jews to bulldoze their third holiest site and erect a Jewish temple on that spot. Uh, I don't think it's talking about the Antichrist sitting in a physical Jewish temple. Jews do not sacrifice lambs anymore. I think it's talking about the Antichrist sitting over the church of God, showing himself that he is God. See, we've also got a temple in heaven. Christ is our high priest in that heavenly temple where he intercedes for us. It says, then the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now let's go to that next last time prophecy. So Jesus, you read in Hebrews, it says, we have a high priest that's ascended into heaven and he intercedes for us. The temple on earth, the Bible tells us, was a miniature picture of a very real temple that you have in heaven. All right, back to our time prophecy. This is the one in Daniel 8 about the 2,300 days or years. If you start in 457, that reaches all the way to 1844. And you might be thinking, what happened there? Well, here are some big turning events in history. Um, back in the, oh, 1830s or so, a number of Christians around the world, most prominent being a Baptist minister named William Miller, studying the prophecies of Daniel, discovered these time periods that the prophecies are pointing to something significant happening 
around 1844. And they called it the Great Advent Movement, not to be confused with Seventh-day Adventists because they didn't exist until 1863. This is the 1830s and 40s, early 1840s. And it, it, it was sweeping the world. There were Catholic priests that were teaching the prophecies of Daniel and a Jewish Christian was traveling, Joseph Wolf and, and others around. And there was a great revival of interest. They said something is going to happen because it says the sanctuary will be cleansed. Two very significant things happened. You see, in the earthly sanctuary, on an annual basis, once a year, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement and make atonement for the people. And the people would be judged, and they went through a service where they were symbolically separated from their sins. It was cleansed from the sins that had been spiritually stored there through the years. Well, Jesus all through history has been serving as our high priest in like the daily uh, capacity. But before his second coming, he entered the final phase. You know, there are seven ages of the church in Revelation. In Revelation, you get the seven churches, chapter 2 and 3. The last age of the church is called the church of Laodicea. The word Laodicea means judging of the people. In 1844, Christ entered the last phase in his work as our high priest in the judgment. See, when Christ comes, he's giving out rewards, right? Behold, I come, my reward is with me. For him to give out rewards when he comes, there must be some investigation before he comes. It's not enough to say, Lord, Lord. He's going to go through the books. The Bible tells us that the books are open. All right, let me see here. And so you got 490 years, and um, during that 490 years, it reaches uh, 1810 years go by, and this is the age of judgment begins in 1844. But not only is Jesus completing his work as our high priest in heaven, what did the angel say? 2,300 years, the sanctuary would be cleansed. Not just cleansed from the sins that had been stored, and Jesus is not done with that work or he'd be here, but it's a cleansing also from the sins that had infiltrated the church on earth. The truth was cast to the ground during the Dark Ages. The church began to teach that you, you burn forever and ever in hell if you're lost. Everlasting burning. They taught that you die and you go right to heaven and hell before a judgment or a resurrection. They were saying you could pay for forgiveness of sins. That you could pray to idols, even though the Bible forbade that. And that you would confess your sins to a priest. All these, that baptism is, is by sprinkling instead of by immersion. You got... All of these strange, unbiblical teachings came into the truth and the sanctuary was defiled. We've got more coming on that. But God began a movement in 1844 where he started to cleanse the sanctuary in heaven and the sanctuary on earth, namely his people. Now, you know, 1844 was a very... I just, I just laughed right now because I realized someone's trying to keep up with me translating all this in Spanish. Dear Carlos, he probably is able to do it though. You know, uh, first electronic message ever given? 1844. Samuel Morris, he sent the message, what had God wrought? Something else happened in 1844. It tells us that uh, Charles Darwin formed his theory for evolution uh, during his voyage on the Beagle. Karl Marx developed his communist manifesto, the birth of evolution, the birth of atheism happened then. It was a, it, the Edict of Toleration was passed allowing Jews to resettle in the Holy Land. The oldest version of the Bible, the Codex Sinaiticus, was discovered reaffirming the truth of God's Word. Railroads began to explode around the world. The Industrial Revolution all happened. It was all during this time period. And several great religious movements <laughs> also happened during the same time. One true and some false. When Jesus did not come in 1844, as many of the Millerites had predicted, a lot of Christians got together from all different backgrounds. And they said, you know, God never intended for the church to be so divided. Let's study the Bible and put away our differences, find out what does the Bible teach. And there were Methodists and Baptists and Catholics and Congregationalists and Presbyterians. And, and they said, what does the Bible teach? And they studied and out of that revival, God began to cleanse his sanctuary. A new movement was born. And that movement now, of which I'm a part, it's called the Seventh-day Adventist Church, 
has spread to over 20 million people around the globe. It's a movement calling people back to the Bible and God is cleansing his sanctuary from the counterfeit teachings of the dark ages. I know you're going to have questions on that and I hope you send them in. So in this final phase of judgment where Christ is in heaven as our high priest, um, what will be the standard and who will be the judge? What will be judged? The dead are judged out of those things that are written in the books. Revelation 20, verse 12. For God will bring every work into judgment with every secret thing. It's all in the books, friends. And it says they're judged by the law of liberty. And in James chapter 2, he mentions two of the Ten Commandments. Uh, Ten Commandments are called the law of liberty. It's not a law of bondage. Is God my accuser in the judgment? No. This final phase of judgment. See, a judgment takes place before Jesus comes. Who is it? Revelation 12, 9 and 10, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, he was cast out into the earth. He is called the accuser of our brethren is cast down that accused them before our God day and night. So as this judgment is taking place in heaven, Satan is the accuser, just like he was accusing Job before the Lord and he was accusing Zechariah, the high priest, before the Lord. He accuses us. And when we pray, Jesus points to our prayers and says, their sins are under the blood. Will I have to face the pre-advent judgment alone? What's the promise? If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen? Now, I know this has been a whirlwind study, and I knew we'd run out of time, which we did. We're going to be taking your Bible questions in just a moment. But the last question if Jesus is your attorney in the judgment, he promises to win your case. He's never lost a case. If you turn your life over to him today, he will put your sins under the blood. We are living in the last phase of the world's history. We're even going to be talking about America in prophecy during this seminar. So you don't want to miss this last week of presentations, friend. But I'd like to pray for you before we close that you will invite Jesus to be your defense attorney. Father in heaven, it's so amazing as we see how accurately the prophecies in the Bible have been fulfilled. Regarding Christ's first coming, he came right on time and you promised I will come again. Lord, we believe we're living in that generation that will witness that. Help us to be ready by surrendering fully to thee and I pray that all those watching will help others get ready as well. That we can make this decision to come to Jesus and then go for Jesus because time is short. Please bless us now, and we thank you with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, don't go away, friends. Coming back in just a moment with Bible questions. Every week, Amazing Facts produces a radio broadcast called Bible Answers Live, where listeners can call in and ask some of the most pressing Bible questions that are circulating in the world today. This popular weekly radio program has reached millions with the truth found in God's Word. Now we've compiled a series of books to help you find clear biblical answers to the meaningful questions about Scripture's most difficult topics. The questions and answers in these books are based on actual calls that have been featured on the Bible Answer Live program. For over 25 years now, Bible Answers Live has given millions the Bible truth they need to better understand the Word and to know God's will for their lives. Now it's your turn. If you've got difficult Bible questions or you're searching for answers, chances are your questions are somewhere in these books. Order your copy of the best of Bible Answers Live today. Life's a curious thing. I mean, just when things seem under control, wham, you're hit with something new. Your marriage is good. Suddenly it's on the brink of divorce. That job's great. And then it's gone. And so is your life savings. You feel healthy. Then your doctor gives the bad news. What's coming next? You could look to the stars, but they don't have the answers. But this does. The Prophecy Study Bible by Amazing Facts. This Bible's special. Its 27 personal study guides lead you on a life-changing journey through God's Word to discover real answers to life's questions, from health and relationships to family and the future. The hope's in here. Get your Amazing Facts Prophecy Study Bible today.
by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. Hello, friends. We want to welcome you back to our Bible question and answer time. And again, we want to thank you for being a part of Revelation Now. Our presentation this evening dealt with the cleansing of the sanctuary. Very important time prophecy. And Pastor Doug, we have quite a few questions relating to Daniel, relating to Revelation that's come in. So I'm excited to get to those questions. Yeah. Uh, but before we take the questions that folks have sent in, we do have some other questions we'd like to put on the screen. Okay. These are common questions that people have when studying these different subjects. So this first question is, what is the difference between accepting Jesus as Savior and accepting Him as Lord? That's good. You know, I think this question may spring from the experience where Jesus is on the cross and the thief that is dying turns to Christ. He says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So he's looking to Jesus to save him from his sins, but he's also saying he's a king. Now, a savior, some people can have a savior, but they don't follow Jesus as king. Some want the Lord to say, forgive my sins, but they really don't want him to rule their lives. And so accepting him as Savior means we accept him as our sacrifice for our sins, our substitute. Accepting him as Lord means I'm willing to take orders from him. He's my king and obey him. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a theological term, maybe justification is accepting Jesus as your Savior. Mm -hmm. But then you have sanctification. That's where you make him Lord of your life. And yeah, you follow exactly. him. Exactly. Good point. Lying to guide. Um, all right, next question that we have. Since the record of sins of God's people was transferred to the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement, does that also make him our sin bearer? Good. You know, I, I didn't have time, I probably don't even have time now to read all of Leviticus 16 where it talks about the Day of Atonement. Uh, but in that service, once a year when the high priest went into the Holy of Holies and he went through a ritual where they would take uh, two goats and uh, one was offered as a sacrifice, and it was called the Lord's goat. So we know which goat is the one symbolizing the Lord. It's the one called the Lord's goat. The other goat, uh, sins were then, uh, the people were transferred to this goat, and it was carried by a fit man out into the wilderness. It was not sacrificed. Mm. Uh, and many believe that um, this is representing the ultimate separation. See, all sin has been caused by Satan. And so while Jesus died for our sins and suffered for our sins, in the end, Satan is going to bear the penalty for his sins and the sins he instigated by tempting everybody to disobey. And so when he's cast into the lake of fire, it represents a, for, uh, a forever separation. And I think that goat was called the uh, Aziel goat. Mm -hmm. And even in, goat. even in many of the cultic religions, they associate that goat with the devil. Mm -hmm. That goat with the devil, I should say. So... Uh, the goat that shed its blood is a type of the Lord, but uh, the scapegoat is the one that, uh, is rumor has it that some guy would take it off in the wilderness, says a fit man, someone dependable. Because if that goat wandered back, goats will follow you. If that, got, that goat wandered back, it was a very bad omen. All their sins had come back on the nation. So he'd, he'd take it up in some ravine and kick it off a cliff. <laughs> I don't know. That's not in the Bible. That's what I've heard, though. Okay. Uh, we have another question. It says, some say that the judgment took place at the cross. Others say that it takes place at death, which is correct. Well, the, the judgment of God for sin was placed upon Jesus in a general sense when he died on the cross. But then the Bible tells us, Paul wrote, since Jesus died, he says, we'll still all stand before the judgment mm -hmm. seat of God. So there is a future judgment where all of us will bow before God. The sins of those who are not saved will rise up before them from the books. And it says, we will all give an account. Christ even said in Matthew chapter 12, we will give an account for every idle word that we spoke. And I have to pray often that God will forgive me because I've got quite a record. And uh, if it wasn't for his mercy, we'd be in big trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's separate from when Jesus died on the cross. Those sins, of course, uh, he was dying for the sin of the whole world in a general sense there. But there is an individual judgment. Okay. All right, we're going to go to some of the questions that have been sent in. And uh, the first one is, what sanctuary does Jesus describe, oh, sorry, what sanctuary does Revelation describe when it talks about Jesus in the book of Revelation? Yeah, we believe this is the sanctuary in heaven that is often spoken of. Uh, where Isaiah had the vision of God on his throne. Mm -hmm. And you have, uh, again, Ezekiel. 
uh, if we read in, and Pastor Ross, you know Hebrews better than I do, uh, where it says that the earthly sanctuary was patterned after the one in heaven. Mm -hmm. So I remember as a kid, I had matchbox cars, and I was really interested to find out that every matchbox car that you buy, that the Mattel or whoever it is that makes them now, they actually take a full-size Jaguar or Corvette or whatever it is, and they use lasers, and they scale it down 100 to 1. And they are actually scaled to size, but very small. The sanctuary on earth was to reflect something about the sanctuary in heaven, not an exact model. But uh, instead of having golden wallpaper up in heaven, God's probably got real angels. Instead of golden angels on the ark, they're real angels by the throne of God, or seraphim, Isaiah saw. So you found that verse? Yeah, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, talks about a talked about Moses, he was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you in the mount. So it says the earthly was a shadow of the heavenly. It's a pattern after some, the original. Right. So yeah, God has the original in heaven. Probably not exactly the same, but it, it's to help us learn the plan of salvation. Okay, we have another question. This is a good one. Why did Jesus curse the fig tree that was full of leaves, knowing there was not the season for figs? Yeah, good question. It seems so out of character of Jesus to curse anything. He spent all his time blessing and healing and giving life. But this was, I think, a very important warning. And let's just be thankful he did it to a tree. Uh, that tree, he said, behold the fig tree and all the trees. That fig tree was a symbol of both the Jewish nation that had all the uh, pretense of fruit, but no fruit. Now, Mrs. Bachelor and I at our former house, our neighbor had a fig tree, and we were lucky enough that it grew over the walls, over the fence, so we could eat some of the figs. And something about fig trees is usually when the leaves are in full bloom, there is ripe fruit. So Jesus, at a distance, he saw that fig tree. Outwardly, it looked like, oh, it would have fruit, but he came and there was no fruit. It had all the outward display. When Christ came to the Jewish nation, they had all the religion, they had the ceremony, they had the temple, they had the outward trappings, but he said, you don't have the fruits. Mm. And if we don't have the fruits, there's a judgment that comes. It's not only true of the Jewish nation, it was true of every believer that he wants us to have the fruits of the Spirit or we'll be under a curse. And that, he cursed the fig tree to uh, really illustrate that important truth. It's also interesting to note that uh, fig leaves in the Bible is used in different forms. Adam and Eve, when they first sinned, they covered the shame of their nakedness, the symbol of sin, with fig leaves. And God yeah. says, self righteousness well, work. You need the robes, you need the, the skins. Yeah. And then, of course, here you have a fig tree covered with leaves, but it's lacking the fruit. So yeah. you have Israel that's lacking the fruits of, of the spirit yeah, of good righteousness. Point. All right, we have another question. It says, when will Jesus stop interceding on our behalf? Uh, will that be uh, at the very end? There's a period of time just before uh, he comes where probation closes. Life continues on earth for a short span when um, you read in uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, and at that time Michael will stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people, and there will be a time of trouble such as there never has been ever since there was a nation, even unto the same time, and at that time thy people will be delivered. So when Michael stands up, it's a symbol that there's no more intercession taking place. And in Revelation, I think there's a place that says that there's silence in heaven. Mm -hmm. for the space of about half an hour, and meaning, you know, heaven has been vacated because the beings are coming to rapture up the believers down here. And so there is a period of time, uh, we're not sure, less than a year, we've talked about the time when the last plagues fall. Mm -hmm. The saved are saved, they're sealed. The lost are lost. And where is that, Revelation 22? Yes, he that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And then Revelation chapter 7 talks about an angel with the seal. And we're going to talk about the seal later on. Yeah. And he says to the other angels, hold back the winds of strife till we have sealed the servants of God in their forward. So point, yeah. the sealing must occur then just before probation closes. And then the seven last plagues. Yeah. So we'll so get into that a little later on. There will be a little on. frightening time just before Jesus comes where... Uh, all Hades will break loose. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and we want to make sure we're sealed. All right. The next question that we have is, I have a question. Uh, I'm not baptized, but I do the will of God. Will I be able to be in heaven? Or do I have to be baptized to be in heaven? 
Well, you know, we have a lesson coming on that that will be also talking about baptism Friday night. I really hope you'll tune in. Anyone with a question on baptism, we're going to talk about that in the context of a verse in Revelation. Yeah. But um, I do want to answer your question in case we don't meet again. Um, there will be some people in heaven that were not baptized. you got many of the Old Testament patriarchs and prophets, and we don't know that they practice baptism. But the last words of Christ are, um, go therefore teach, baptize. Jesus said, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. Why someone would say, I believe and not want to be baptized would make me question. It's kind of like a man telling a woman, I love you and I want to marry you, but I don't want to live with you. Or I, I don't want to go through the ceremony. <laughs> or, you know, it just, I always wonder why wouldn't you want to? So that, I think, points to a dip, deeper problem. If God commands it and we deliberately disobey that command, now, someone, if they're in the hospital on their deathbed and they come to Christ and they can't be baptized, they'll be in heaven. But if a person can be and they're living in disobedience, that's a real concern. That's right. And of course, there's a blessing in being baptized. Yeah. Uh, God wants to give us a special anointing of his spirit. And yeah. when Jesus was baptized, there was a voice from heaven. This is my beloved son. And I think we might not hear a voice from heaven when we're baptized, but we know we're doing those things that are pleasing to God. Amen. And there's a blessing in that. All right, next question that we have. Why does the Bible use prophetic days and so many symbols? Well, th there's two questions really there. Um, one reason that God used symbols in the apocalyptic prophecies, and a lot of the prophecies are very clear, but some of the Old Testament prophets in, in Revelation, they were all given why God's people were being occupied by alien powers. Uh, and in the prophecies, they often talk about the fall of those alien powers. That would have been seen as treason if they had, if John had plainly written that uh, Rome is uh, going to be destroyed. Uh, they would have seen that as a treacherous threat, and, and the books would have been destroyed. So God put it in symbolic language that Jews typically understood. The keys for these are in the Bible: Ezekiel, Zechariah. I think Haggai has a little bit. Revelation. They're kind of some of these. Daniel, of course, written in. Uh, with symbols. And then a day for a year. Um, uh, you know, the Bible says right at the beginning, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. Uh, well, that's actually Second Peter chapter 3, but God told Adam, in the day you eat thereof, you will surely die. Well, he lived a thousand years, or 900. And so, uh, you know, God tries to give us the eternal perspective that for him, a day is nothing. It's like a, year, a day for us is a year for God. Mm -hmm. or no, a year for us is like a day for him. Mm -hmm. And so I think he just helps us try to keep the eternal perspective. Okay. Another question is coming. When did Jesus turn water into wine, and what is the prophetic significance? Yeah, that's a good question. That's John chapter 2, the first miracle of Christ at uh, Cana. And he was at a wedding, and uh, they ran out of grape juice. Keep in mind, the word, the word wine is often interchangeable with the word grape juice in the Bible. It was the, the juice of the grape wasn't always fermented. I just want to make sure people don't think that the party started to uh, drag down because they'd run out of booze. And Jesus said, I'm going to help you really spice things up. I'm going to make a whole bunch. I think he made like 120 gallons of it or something. But um, he really made grape juice. And uh, that is a symbol of the blood of Christ. The first miracle of Jesus, they ran out of wine. He gave them pure grape juice at a wedding. And it's like a marriage proposal. The last thing that happens before Jesus dies, humans offered him sour wine. He tasted it, said it was finished, and died. It's almost like a blood transfusion. He took our sour, our mm. sins. He gave us his pure mm. grape juice. They said, you've saved at the wedding. When he turned the water to wine, it was really pure grape juice. They said, where'd you get this? It's not even the harvest. You've saved the best for last. Some people in America, they think, oh, the best, that's a good stuff. That's hard liquor. I didn't mean that for them. They could get it fermented all year long. You could not get fresh grape juice except at the harvest. It's usually concentrated and rehydrated and never tasted as good. And he gives us his pure grape juice. It's his blood for our sins, but he took our sour wine. He took our sin at the cross. So it's like a transfusion, so to speak. Yeah, a that's a great point. And then, of course, um, marriage in the Bible sometimes symbolizes Christ's union with his church. Yeah. The church is described as the bride. The marriage supper of the Lamb takes place because of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. So mm -hmm. 
number of interesting yeah. symbols you can you can draw from that. All right, here it is, Pastor Doug. Is smoking cannabis a sin? <laughs> you knew it was well, coming. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't know it was coming. <laughs> we don't preview these life questions, friends. Well, friends, l let me just tell you that, um, first of all, I don't think, if, if there's a beneficial medicine in cannabis, and uh, I'm not uh, a pharmacist and I'm not going to weigh in on that, uh, there, you know, the Bible does tell us that there are certain medicines that come from various herbs that may have some beneficial value. Uh, I think often those things are abused, you know, you can put tobacco on an ant bite and, or bee sting, and it really helps. I mean, there, there's good things that some of these things do. If you want to keep ants away from your house, you put go coffee grounds around your house. They won't cross it. <laughs> so there are some wonderful things you can do with these things and that are abused. Uh, most of the people I know that are smoking cannabis, mm. smoking is not the best way to use the medicinal value of something uh, because there's damage that's done. Uh, so... Uh, you know, a lot of people I know that are getting miracle, medical marijuana. Uh, friends, uh, yes, I inhaled. I used to grow pot before I was a Christian. I, I smoked it with my mother when I was 13, so I know all about it. I gave it up w before it was even cool to start. And so I knew all about it, and, but um, it just made you stupid. Hmm. And I'm sorry. When you have to stare at your tennis shoes for 10 minutes to try and figure out how to tie them, <laughs> and it just, it's not helping you get to heaven. Now, if there's a medicinal value and a doctor prescribes it, and you know, that's a different issue. But a lot of people are getting mer medical marijuana licenses, and it's really recreational. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so... So maybe we could put that in the same category then as just smoking tobacco? Yeah. And of course, you don't want to pollute the body. And the body's the temple of the Holy Spirit. That's right. You don't want to keep it and clean. And it's a defiling. The Bible Especially says the we should not defile our temples. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's an interesting question. If God appoints kings... Does that apply, apply to modern-day presidents? Well, the Lord tells us, and you might have to help me find the verse, Pastor Ross, where uh, in Daniel, God says uh, the Lord takes kings down. It might be Daniel chapter 2. He takes kings down, and he raises kings up, and he, he will set over an empire even the basest of men. You know, Nebuchadnezzar thought that uh, everybody was so lucky to have him. He said, it's not this great Babylon that I built. God said, I can blink my eyes and turn you into a raving animal, which is what happened. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, sometimes the Lord will set up uh, great leaders. If the Bible talks about good leadership, God can bless that nation with that. And it's, they, a good leader can be a real blessing. The wrong leader can be a real curse. And it can also even be a judgment. So God can allow these things to happen in uh, both cases. Okay, yes, the story you're referring to there is Daniel chapter 2, and then we also find it when Nebuchadnezzar went mad. Yeah, and, uh, he came Daniel back chapter 4. Came back yeah. to his senses, yeah. Okay, um, next question that we have. What does it mean to anoint the most holy? And I think you touched on that a little bit in your presentation But tonight. no, I'm glad they asked again, because the word, uh, when you say Christ, uh, if someone christens a ship, they often take a champagne bottle and, and whack it over the bow, and they, they call it christening. When a baby's christened, they sprinkle water on it. The word Christos means anoint. And so Christ is called Jesus Christ. I used to think that was his last name, like right. Miller, you know, right. or something. And, and it's really Jesus was his name. Christ was his office, who he was. He's the Messiah. Messiah is the Hebrew word for anointed. So they're both the same word. When uh, God chose a king or priest, like when David was anointed by Samuel, they put oil on him. It was a symbol of him being spirit-filled. Uh, the priests were often anointed. The sacrifice might be anointed. Mary poured some oil before Jesus died on his feet and on his head. And uh, so he was anointed, in a sense, mm -hmm. at his, just before his death, and he was anointed at the beginning of his ministry with the Holy Spirit. So he was anointed as our Savior, our teacher, and our sacrifice. So Christ is the anointed. And he was anointed, though, in AD 27 at his baptism. He began his ministry. No record of Christ performing a miracle before that. Okay. Uh, do you have to be on your knees when praying to God to be accepted by him? Uh, no. Um, you know, God, posture does say something about prayer, and typically people, if you're healthy and you're able to, it's good if you're going to come to Christ and kneel and accept Jesus it represents submission and humbling of yourself. 
uh, you know, if a person has got a health problem or a knee problem, they can't do that, or they might accept Christ and they're, Peter was drowning and he prayed while he was swimming. You can't kneel at all times. I've had people come to Christ. They said, I was driving my car and I couldn't pull over and I wept and I drove down the road and prayed with you on the radio. And so, mm -hmm. you know, God wouldn't say, oh, you got to pull over and kneel. Um, but it's appropriate, I think, uh, for those that are healthy at some point in our worship to kneel mm -hmm. in the morning before this program. I go upstairs and I kneel down and I pray. Uh, in the morning, I always kneel and pray. But in our church, we kneel at some point, we stand. The Bible says Solomon knelt and he stood when he prayed. So you can pray. Nehemiah prayed while he was pouring grape juice mm -hmm. for the king. <laughs> okay, here's a good question. It says, if Jesus said that not one stone shall be left upon another, why is the wailing wall still built? Good, good question. And uh, Pastor Ross and I and Mrs. Bachelor, Mrs. Ross, we were all together in Israel a couple of years ago and we got up close and personal with that wall, and I'll tell you, there are some massive stones. The, there's two parts of the wall it's talking about. You've got the foundation walls that supported a platform. And so there's this wall outside of Jerusalem that goes up, and it supported a platform. The temple was built on that platform. Uh, and then there was a wall on top of the platform. The temple was within its confines. Not one stone was left upon another uh, on that inner wall. They were all thrown down. You can see the rubble. They'll even show you. You walk by and you see these massive stones. They haven't even moved them from the days mm -hmm. of the Romans. Some of them are still sitting where they threw them 70 AD, uh, 1930 years ago. Um, so when you see the Wailing Wall, you're often seeing some of that had been repaired later by um, um, some of the Ottoman leaders. But you're seeing a piece of the wall that was part of a foundation wall mm -hmm. kind of for, retaining wall yeah for the temple so all this all the walls that actually built the temple itself they were knocked down but they were the retaining walls yeah. that had been built now we did that even probably predates till after the babylonian captivity maybe even before oh some yeah. of those retaining walls date it goes back, back to way. solomon yeah, yeah. but uh, even when we were there um we didn't get to go into the mosque of omar because right. it was we were there during ramadan and Passover, uh, there's a bunch of holidays all at once. But uh, y years ago when I was there, you could go up on the platform. You could then see, oh, this is where the temple was. Mm -hmm. The Wailing Wall is actually below that. Mm -hmm. I think we're out of time. All right, yes. Should we tell them about the next meetings? Absolutely. We don't have a meeting tomorrow evening. That's Thursday right. night. But we will have another live program, very important program, on Friday evening. And that's 7 p.m. Pacific time. Again, it's not too late to tell your friends. Uh, if you've missed any of the previous programs, take a look at the uh, Revelation Now website, and you can view the archive, and you can see all of the other programs. Yes, and please do tune in. for uh, t uh, Friday night's program is going to be a, a life and death issue that I think people are going to be blessed by. And then we will have a Saturday morning program. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've learned the Sabbath truth. We call it Sabbath morning. That will be 11 o'clock California time. We're going to be talking about the beast of revelation and then the that evening the mark of the beast and so we got a double header make sure and tell your friends to tune in and you will be blessed and you want to see the materials as well absolutely so we look forward to seeing you again on friday evening and again to pass the word look forward to seeing you then